G'day everyone, this is Peter Price again from Classroom Professor. Welcome to this video which is the second one in the Developing Number Fluency series. In this video I'm going to talk more in depth about developing mental strategies to develop fluency. So I've got a number of topics on the board to keep me on track. I didn't draw the pictures this time. Uh, we're going to start with modeling. So the strategies that we're building up in our students, ultimately we want those to be held in their minds. We want them to be able to visualize them and think about them. But at the start we're going to use models. Pictures are perfectly fine, but visual representations or physical representations. Here's an example. So here we have um, the basic addition number fact of 9 plus 4. And we would show this to students using a pair of 10 frames like this. And then my approach would be not to tell them what to do, but to say, think for yourselves, what do you think you can do to make this easier to work out? And of course, it's not difficult to see that if you simply move one of the counters from there to there, we started with 9 plus 4, but now we've got 10 plus 3. And 10 plus 3 is a simple place value question. So the idea would be for the students to, as I said, be able to think for themselves and to recognize the features of the numbers rather than have to listen to us explain it. They're more likely to pick that up. And then after doing that, I would just try some other questions and say, OK, let's do 9 plus 5. Um, let's do 9 plus 7 and so on with the aim of the students recognizing that it's the same process every time. And again, hopefully that would happen naturally, if you like, organically, that some students would say, hang on, this is the same method. We keep doing the same thing rather than you asking them if they've noticed. So that would be ideal. So this is um, this particular strategy it we call a near 10 strategy because 9 is near 10 we can make an adjustment to the other number and then we have 10 plus another number and uh, that makes it easy to do. Now um, I'll just mention 10 frames as a general teaching resource at this point. I would recommend that teachers of young students use 10 frames all the time. So basically for all numbers up to 10 initially and then up to 20, students can use 10 frames to enable them to subitize, to see how many counters there are without counting, to recognize patterns of numbers so that when you look at this pattern of red counters, you can see it's 9. You don't have to count 1, 2, 3, 4 up to 9. You can see it's 9 providing you know about the numbers up to 10 because there's clearly one less. And you can see this is 6 for a couple of reasons. You can see it's two rows of 3. Um, you can see there are four empty ones left. If we rearrange them like that, you can see it's 6 as well because you've got a, a row of 5 and one more. So we want our students to become familiar from the earliest years with the numbers, as I said, up to 10 and then up to 20 in patterns that they can become familiar with. They're a bit like um, the dot patterns on a die or a dice. So for example, on an ordinary dice, you'd see a pattern of four like that. The trouble with the dice is they only go up to six. So the 10 frame allows us to go all the way up to 10 and then on to 20. So we would use modeling a lot. And we would use it for each of the operations, for addition and subtraction to start with here with 10 frames and then multiplication and division. Depending on the strategy, we can use 10 frames again or we can use other visual models and so on. Now I'd like to point out here that there's a risk that students may attach a stigma to using models counters and blocks and that sort of thing. I think it's important for a teacher to say there is nothing wrong with using pictures. And in fact, mathematicians working out highly complex questions will draw pictures on a napkin or something or, or sketch ideas as a way of structuring their thinking to help them think through a problem. So there is absolutely nothing wrong with using some sort of model or picture to understand numbers and to you know, be able to hold information in a visual form while you think about something else, which is really what we're doing here. 
Now we would add to this discussion, um, initially led by the teacher, but then of course discussion among the students. So for example, with a question like the first one, uh, 9 plus 4 for example, and we would ask the students, can you see what you could do to make that easier? Ask them to talk to each other, to consolidate their understanding, to bring along as many of the students as possible so they're not relying just on, you know, the brightest child in the class who gets the answer right straight away. Um, but the, the, there's as much thinking going on as possible and that the students are, there's this collective understanding of how we approach number facts so that when um, another benefit here is that when the teacher says, oh, this is a doubles strategy, the students get used to that language and they know what the teacher means and that triggers their thinking in those areas. So the, the discussion is meant to develop the thinking and along with that the visualising so that, as I said in the previous video, ultimately we don't want the students using strategies at all. We want them just to know their number facts. So that's where we're aiming for. We're just not going to push it too fast. We're not going to, you know, demand too much of the students too early. We're going to give them as much scaffolding and support and structure as we can to allow them to develop it. So it's not a matter of us, you know, sort of driving them along with the stick saying, come on, learn your number facts, but rather presenting pictures and models and discussions and questions so that their own minds will come up with it. One of the things that we know is that human beings have a capacity for imagination. It seems we were designed that way to be able to picture things in our mind. We ultimately want this to become something that students can just picture. And we might use an exercise with young students and say, close your eyes, can you picture a 10 frame with four counters in it? How many empty spaces are there? And I think a lot of students who've done this sort of exercise would be able to do that and that would help perhaps strengthen that ability. And then once the students are making progress with that, once they're getting the answers right consistently, we will do more practice and even drill to consolidate that memory, that understanding and to um, fix it in their minds, I suppose. Now I hasten to add, this is not drill of rote repetition of the number facts. We're not saying two twos are four, two twos are four, two threes are six, you know, until eventually we're not drilling that, but we're drilling the use of the strategy. It's a bit like a couple of different adult contexts. One is driving a car and one is playing sport. Now, if you drive a car, you'll remember no doubt when you were learning to drive a car, how terribly complicated it was. And you had to, you know, use the accelerator and then put this foot on the clutch and change gears over here and look in the mirror and turn your indicator on and turn the steering wheel, you know, and our instructor kept saying, no, no, stop. And I remember mine putting his foot on the brake really fast because I was doing everything except looking where the car coming the other way was. And it, it, there are just so many things to take into account or to, to do. It's a physical training, obviously, but you know, it, it's so difficult. But as you practice, and as you practice, and you keep doing it, and you keep doing it, eventually you can change gears without even thinking about it. And the, the gear lever just slots into the right place if it's a manual car. And you know, you know where to flick your fingers for the indicators and so on. And almost without realizing it, you become able to drive a car without thinking about it. To the point where if you've been driving for any number of years, you can drive halfway across town and not even remember whether the traffic lights were red or green or, you know, which corner you went round in which order, or, you, you know, you, you don't even remember the experience of driving. You did it automatically because you've practiced. Now, I'm no good at sport, but those who do play sport practice over and over and over and over and over and over so they can compete in the Olympics or in international competitions or, or you know even local competitions and they will practice kicking the ball or hitting the ball or spiking in volleyball and, and so on over and over again so when that ball pops up in volleyball the player knows exactly the angle to hit it which part of the hand it's got I didn't, don't even know which part it is and they know what it feels like when you hit it and they can spear that ball into the back corner because they've practiced it so much. It's a bit like that with number facts. We want the students to get to the point where they're not thinking, 
9 plus 4, oh that means I've got to remove 1, that'll make that one 3, plus 10, 10 plus 3 is 13. We do want them to do that when they're learning the strategy, but ultimately they're going to do that so many times I go, it's 13, 9 plus 4, 13, 9 plus 4, 13. Just do it so often that they just get it. And then ultimately we're going to go for speed. So when the students have got it, we don't want to stop when they're getting it slowly and you know you just got to wait a little while and then they'll get it we keep pushing and keep pushing and encourage the students to see that their own abilities are improving um, our evidence is and I'll talk about this more in a future video that teachers who've used this approach that I'm recommending are seeing amazing results from students who enjoy being timed and enjoy seeing that what they're seeing is their own progress and they know that they're getting better and they don't even have to be the best in the class to have an enormous sense of pride that they're getting faster and faster and better and better at their maths because they really care about it of course and they they really want to do well i'd like to put all this in context in the context of teaching operations so i'll just talk about this briefly I recommend a four phase model for teaching operations and one of those, the second phase, is teaching number facts. So the first phase is developing the concept and this will generally happen with young children uh, as young as kindergarten, prep, foundation, whatever it's called where you are, um, preschool, where the students are telling stories and modelling with toy teddy bears and Lego people and toy cars and that sort of thing and developing an understanding of what adding means and what taking away and subtracting means and multiplying and dividing and sharing and so on. So uh, a time to develop language and connections and connect the understanding of a con you know an everyday context and the language that we use for that. So no symbols but just um, the, the, the language and the concept. Then we move on to number facts. So this is where we go through the strategies, we do it in depth, we take our time over it and we wait long enough for, if possible, all the students to know their number facts before we move on to doing the algorithms. Basically, if the students don't know their number facts, in my view, they're not ready for operations, they're not ready for algorithms. I mean, if you had a child with with chronic learning disabilities, you know, a really serious um, special need uh, and they just couldn't get their number facts, I'd question why they're doing algorithms at all. You know, seriously a child who couldn't do it at all and just had a, 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 an incapacity to do it for whatever reason, I'd say let's find another way to do it. But anyway, that's a, a, a sort of minor point. Number facts, so really get the number facts down pat, do it so the students don't need the models and the materials, go to layer into the practice and drill phase. And then ask them to explore the operation. So before teaching an operation, I would give examples like this. And I've deliberately written this in a horizontal format. And I would say to students, here are two numbers, I want you to add them together using whatever method you like except if your parents or so if you've got an older brother who's shown you another way to do it I don't want you to use that way I want you to think for yourself what is a way any way you like that'll let you add these together and get you an answer or oh, no calculators either and so I would expect the students could say and they might start with the tens and say well that's 40 and 20 that makes 60 and then we've got a 7 and an 8. And I know 7 and 8 is double 7 and one more. That's a strategy. That makes 15. And together that makes 75. So we're exploring invented methods, certainly non-conventional methods, but ways of carrying out the operation without a formal algorithm to follow. It's not a phase you'll use for a very long time, but you can see, I hope, that it's consistent with this idea of visualizing and thinking and discussing and developing the student's number fluency in the area, in this case, of operations. But in a sense, it's really an extension of number facts. Think about the numbers. How do they go together? What can you see that fits? You know, the fact that this is 40 and 20, they go together. 
to make six tenths and that sort of thing. So a, a very powerful phase in this process. And then of course you move on to the conventional algorithm. And I won't talk about that. That's, that's really well known by, by all teachers. But at the fourth, fourth phase, the students will, will do that conventional algorithm. And of course they'll know their number facts from having done that before. So that's how this whole developing number fluency fits into a bigger picture of the maths curriculum and where we're going with uh, the maths education that we give our students. So that's come to the end of this video. I hope that you've enjoyed it and I look forward to talking to you again soon.